I'll go back to the second type of tools that we have in the database, namely the analysis tools. And okay. So um, you can find those uh, by going to the analysis tools on, on the uh, tools homepage. And what I'll cover in this uh, section of the presentations is the population coverage tools, epitope conservancy analysis tools, and the cluster analysis tools. Um, there's also a homology mapping tool, and I believe Julia is going to talk about that a bit. Um, or, or if not, uh, you can ask me about that separately. Um, population coverage. So as you have heard, uh, the cons uh, there's lots of considerations that need to be taken into account when designing sets of epitopes in order to ensure that, um, that, are, uh, that the epitopes with known MHC restriction will match the population that you want to cover. Having a perfect set of epitopes that say are uh, great for HLA AO201 will only work in a subset of the population. So one criteria by which designing a, a pool of peptides uh, would be that in a population with a mixed uh, diverse HLA, um, there's going to be at least one peptide or more peptides that are going to be reactive in each of the different patients. So the way this is done uh, in this tool is based on known HLA um, allele frequencies in different populations, and it's assuming uh, non-linkage district equilibrium. Uh, and these frequencies that we're using are from the allele frequencies dot net uh, uh, web page. Um, this is how the tool looks like, and here as an example, um, the, the, the idea is again that you have a set of epitopes already, and then you're trying to calculate what's the population coverage of that epitope data set. So in this example, uh, if you have a set of uh, 12, 11 MHC class II restricted epitopes that are promiscuous uh, HLA binders, what is the coverage in North African populations? So you can choose the populations here, um, and uh, um, th those are then, essentially these populations are uh, retrieved from the allele frequencies of that database, and they are then, uh, each of these populations essentially is then uh, related to a table um, that says how frequent different alleles are in that population. And then the second set of input you need is uh, the set of epitopes, and these can be just any names, it doesn't matter. What really is uh, important is the information which uh, HLA really needs they're reactive to. So this could be based on experimental data, this could be based on prediction data, etc. So once you enter these, uh, you click compute, and you're getting a, a bunch of results back. So uh, up top is the summary table says that the coverage, so how many people will be um, reacting to at least one, and the number of av average number of peptides reactive uh, in a given um, population, and the 90%, uh, so, so the, uh, how many people, uh, like, like what is the number of epitopes that at least 90% are going to react to? I'll explain those into more detail. You also see here, an example, this is 0% coverage. Um, this, this does happen uh, primarily if there's lack of information in the allele frequencies of net database. So if you have outliers like this, it's worthwhile um, inspecting the allele frequencies uh, for that specific population. So looking at the data for one of the populations, uh, what you have here is uh, the number of epitope hits slash HLA combinations recognized. So you have 11 epitopes, but a given epitope could be binding to multiple different HLA alleles. And for each number of essentially recognition events, you have uh, the number of donors uh, that are reacting with that number. So, so there's 23 donors that are projected to not react with any of the peptides in the pool. Uh, then there's, um, as you see, like here's the, uh, kind of a peak. Um, like uh, there's, an, uh, like, what is it, 21? Uh, donors are going to react with um, uh, 10 of the epitopes, and you see kind of like a, like a peak here. You have a peak of uh, donors that, that uh, react with many, many uh, HLA allele combinations, HLA peptide combinations. You have another peak here, kind of the average population. Then you have some that are missed completely. So this kind of explains now um, these numbers. So the coverage is essentially what percent are going to react with at least one of the epitopes. The average hit is going through, okay, on average, uh, you see in the cumulative, essentially that's the cumulative percentage of around 50. Uh, that's where you're at the average. So, 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 so the average number of, uh, this is actually the median. Uh, but if you would look for, 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 if you average the number of hits per donor, you get at uh, 
and uh, the PC90 is looking for 90% of the population, how many um, peptides are you going to be reactive with? So those are the numbers that you get from the table, which is essentially summarizing these plots. So the second tool I'm going to talk about is the conservancy analysis, uh, which calculates the degree of conservancy of an epitope within the given protein sequence. And I showed you an example at the start uh, how we've used these tools for um, doing the swine flu analysis. Uh, the degree of conservation is uh, defined as the fraction of protein sequences containing the epitope at a given identity level. So there's the, the two things. You have a set of uh, proteins and you're asking uh, how conserved is my peptide in each of these proteins. And then uh, the, the, the degree of identity is uh, for each of these proteins how, 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 how much percent of the residues are conserved. And, oops, that's the wrong button. So, um, this is the example I gave in the introduction. I'm just going to show a little more detail here. So these are the set of peptides that you care about. And then you have the set of protein sequences um, where you're looking for conservation of these peptides in these protein sequences. And um, yeah, that's this. Uh, now you're getting um, these kinds of results back. And I showed these before. Essentially, you have an example here of a peptide that is recognized in none of the, uh, it is not conserved at 100% identity level in any of these uh, protein sequences versus this guy is. And if you now look into detail for that specific peptide, you get the more detailed results back. So here now you have the different uh, protein sequences. And for each of them, you have the position which the best match of the peptide is found. In this case, the exact peptide was found at 100% identity in all of these sequences. As you see, I mean, the, all of these are uh, the hemagglutinin sequences uh, of the virus, which you would expect because these are hemagglutinin epitopes. Finally, the cluster analysis. So quite frequently, as you've seen, we have um, results when you, when you look for, for epitopes, when you query for epitopes that are very related. They're just isoform of each other. And um, if you want to see uh, how these things um, belong together to really identify how many really unique regions do you have, you can use this cluster analysis tool. So essentially what it does, it groups epitopes together based on identity, and, and yeah, one cluster is then defined as the group of sequences which have a similarity with each other greater than a minimum uh, identity threshold, and yeah, this is the tool. So essentially all you do is just add sets of peptides in here, either in plain sequence fast or fast start format, and you uh, specify what is the identity level that you care about uh, here and run the cluster tool. And then this is the kind of output you're getting. Um, you see here uh, there's peptides that have no similarity to any of the others in the set. And you see here an example of actually a big cluster where you can see the same small peptide here is contained in this one, contained in this one, and so on. That was it. That was a short and, and brief overview of the analysis tool. So any, uh, and we know that these are kind of special, so we're keeping this short. If you are particularly interested in any of these, this would be good ones to do in, on the one-to-one -one basis. We don't want to spend that much time on something that not many people uh, use. So I don't see questions, and I also would like to... The cluster analysis, is that really something that's useful for, for example, when you have the MH? MHC class two with lots of overlapping, and you might want to analyze which ones. Right, that would be one example. Another example is like if you query the IDB for something like like uh, epitopes in a given protein, uh, you very often get all these very slight variants back, and then to see how many really different ones do you actually have. Okay. Um, also, it actually, as a typical outcome from a prediction tool, when you're running, say, say uh, uh, predictions against sets of viruses that are uh, isoform of each other, uh, again, you want to see which ones are when you're essentially covering the same region over and over again.